All right, guys. Well, let's get started this evening. I want to welcome all of you who have joined us tonight for our 13th week in a row of our Wine Down Wednesday event, where Adele and I talk, taste, and travel the world from the comfort of our homes and invite you guys to join along with us. I'm going to share my screen with y'all right now. Um, so bear with me for just a second. And... Looks like I, uh, I was practicing earlier, so <laughs> we started in the, in the middle of everything. So welcome again to our Talk, Taste, and Travel weekly event. It's really great to have all of you and to see so many new faces tonight. Uh, we have a couple of updates that I just wanted to share with y'all. We have lots of guests who join us on a weekly basis, and in the past, we've kept the call open kind of indefinitely for people to hang out and to chat and to jump in and to get to know each other. And I think that's absolutely awesome. And I want to encourage you guys to start your own happy hours after this event. We are committed to ending on time, moving forward, and to keeping our event uh, within that designated time frame. And so we won't be keeping it just open forever uh, indefinitely afterwards anymore. But we have had so much fun uh, chatting with you guys over the past several weeks and getting to know a bunch of you. And we hope that that can continue on. But we have lots of guests who are going to be joining us over the next few weeks. And so we're just making a few changes moving forward to make sure everything runs smoothly and uh, to coordinate with them so that you guys also have an opportunity to interact with them a little bit when they are on the call with us. So welcome again. I am going to pass it off to Adele tonight. Um, if you guys do have any questions throughout the chat, throughout the call this evening. There is a little chat feature on your screen. You can send each other private messages if you want to talk to each other, or if you have questions for me, for Adele, or for Paul, our guest from Boundary Breaks joining us later this evening, type them in the question box and we'll answer that, or type them in the chat and we'll answer them as we go along so that we can keep things kind of moving and so that nobody uh, gets left out. So with that, Adele, I will pass it off to you, and let's, let's go to New York. Hi, guys. How are you? Uh, happy Wednesday, Wind Down Wednesday. You know, we've been doing these since April, so it's been several weeks of fun Wednesday times, just me and Kristen kind of getting together and, and chatting, so it's nice to have everyone along. Um, a few updates about us here over at 13 Celsius. We're still open for to-goes every single day. We're not able to reopen. There has been no word from the governor if they're going to allow 51% uh, establishments to reopen or not. So in the meantime, uh, don't forget about us for your wine needs. Uh, we've got 35% off wines and beers, and we're open from four until nine daily. Um, this weekend on Saturday is National Wine and Cheese Day. So I've actually put together a couple of curated cheese and wine packs. Uh, so if you guys are interested, send me an email, Adele at 13celsius.com or info at 13celsius.com. They all funnel into my email address. If you guys are interested in getting any cheese and wine for Saturday to, to celebrate, it's supposed to be kind of a stormy weekend. So what a better way to like nibble on some cheese and drink a bunch of wine and stay inside. Um, and another event that we have coming up as well, if you guys are looking for more ways to stay connected with us uh, at 13, we've got a chef pop-up for next Friday and another one for the Friday and Saturday after that. So we have a couple of fun things where like a chef will come in and do like a food to go. So we'll pair wines with it. So you take your meal, take your wine to go. Uh, just try to stay connected uh, with everyone in this time. But uh, something that Chris and I actually had a conversation about uh, right before COVID was if her and I were to team up together and do like a wine trip, where would we go? And we both kind of were thinking about places domestically and the Finger Lakes had kind of come across our mind as an idea of something that maybe not everyone has done before when traveling somewhere, there's Napa, everyone's done, you know, these Sonoma Napa trips and stuff like that. But um, maybe the Finger Lakes was something kind of different. And it's, I'll admit, a region that I don't know a whole lot about because, you know, I personally have never been there before, but obviously I know a little bit about like wine and wine theory. Uh, just last night, I think my fiance was asking me, do you even know the names of the Finger Lakes? And I was like, 
what like Lake Michigan, Lake Superior? And he's like, no, those are the Great Lakes, dummy. And I was not dummy, but you know, um, it was an interesting time to like look up some of the information and really look at a map and, and see how cool these wines are in some of the vineyards and places. Um, wine and grapes first came to the state of New York, but at the time was actually called New Amsterdam in the 17th century by the Dutch. Um, New York State has technically been planting uh, grapes and growing wine for quite some time. And during the 17th, 17th century, when all the settlers were coming into the New World, there was all sorts of experimentation with which, which crops worked well, and grapes happened to work pretty well in the country. But when you think about New York, you don't necessarily think about quality wines to this day. And why is that? And that is because New York really isn't recognized for quality wine production. Um, over 80% of the vines in New York are not used for wine at all, but they're used for like Concord grape juice or like commercial grapes. They're not made for like quality wines. Um, in fact, I don't know if anyone has ever had like communion wine before or something called Mogan David, uh, but it's one of those type wines that mostly makes up the production of New York. Um, but in the 1950s, there was a guy, his name is Dr. Constantine Frank. And if there's one name that you should remember from Finger Lakes Wine, it is Dr. Constantine Frank. Uh, he was a viticulturist. He came from the Ukraine, uh, and he saw the Finger Lakes part of New York as a potential for making fantastic Riesling, of all grapes, Riesling. Uh, and the reason for this is because of like the situation of where these are, the terroir, um, and where the lakes are sort of an aspect of longitude and latitude in the world. Uh, the lakes themselves, they provide crisp, fresh water for the vineyards. Uh, and then they also have a significant effect um, on the climate because you are pretty far north and there is the potential for frost to happen. And uh, by being close to a body of water, it actually kind of mitigates some of that frost from ever coming in and, and basically freezing your grapes in a bad way. Although there is freezing your grapes in a good way and that's called ice wine. And we are gonna talk about that a little bit later with Paul. Uh, so today, the Finger Lakes, uh, makes up 90% of all of the wine that's produced in New York uh, for quality wine. Um, and some of the main grapes that they grow besides Riesling, you've got Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, Gewürztraminer for some white grapes, uh, some red grapes, you've got Pinot Noir. Uh, Cabernet Franc is showing some promise. And then of course the Concord grape, uh, which is the amateur communion wine. Um, and the reason the Concord grape you see used for just like regular drinking and not for actual quality winemaking is that the grape itself is too high in acid and too low in sugar. So it never even has the potential to ever make any quality wines. Kristen, have you ever had communion wine? Kristen, okay. Uh, I have. Um, I think some of the some of the people on this call were present during my catholic upbringing and uh i have had communion wine uh i also went to uh college in missouri and concord was grown down there and that was kind of my first introduction to it and uh i was always surprised by how by how um proud <laughs> they were of it um so that was always, yeah, that was always interesting to me. Have you ever mixed red wine and Coke? Coca-Cola? No, I haven't. <laughs> it's called the Calimocho, and it's actually something that they drink, but I always find that lesser quality red wines tend to be okay with Coca-Cola. <laughs> That's probably not for me, but I'm not a Coca-Cola <laughs> fan in general, um, unless every once in a while I like, a, I like a good Mexican Coke by itself. Um, well, let's talk about how we get to the Finger Lakes. So the Finger Lakes is located in New York, as we kind of covered. And I love that we have this map here that, kinds, that kind of shows us how to get there and how far it is from everywhere. It shows you exactly where in New York the Finger Lakes are. And the major airport that you would typically fly direct to from Houston is either going to be Buffalo or Toronto. As you guys all know, um, direct flights are few and far between right now, and uh, unfortunately flying to Toronto isn't in the near future, but there is a lot to do in New York. 
Many of you guys who are new to the call may not know this, but I do own a travel agency based here in Houston. And New York is one of the uh, city or cities, one of the states that uh, is requiring that has stricter entry requirements right now. So for all people entering uh, by air, you have to fill out a travel health uh, verification document in advance. And if you're coming from a state with rising COVID cases, you do have to self quarantine for 14 days. So unfortunately, if you are in Texas and want to go tomorrow, you would have to quarantine. So this is something to maybe think about for the near future or excuse me for the future. Um, hopefully by the fall, things will be looking a little bit better and fall is the perfect time to visit New England and you can take a foliage road trip and incorporate the Finger Lakes into one of these uh, itineraries super easily, whether you're going to Boston, to DC, to Toronto, Buffalo, and these destinations are connected by the Amtrak as well. So you can take the Amtrak into Rochester, New York, and then I believe into Syracuse as well. What to do in the Finger Lakes? We'll get into Seneca Lake in a little bit more detail with Paul later in the call, but some of the highlights in the region besides wine are Watkins Glen State Park and Tuganuck Falls State Park. Uh, some of our, our people here who are a little bit more familiar with the region may uh, correct me on some of my pronunciations up there, but um, it is, but I'm, I'm doing the best doing the best I can right now, y'all. Um, so the things to keep in mind about Watkins Glen State Park is this is really an awesome place to go for short hikes and you walk by 19 waterfalls. So the hike itself is only about two miles. It's really great if you just wanna get out and break up your wine tasting with a little scenic walk around the area. And then Tuganuck Falls is the other big option where you can see some of those really beautiful uh, waterfalls. And these are just great places to really immerse yourself in nature. Seneca Lake has this amazing wine trail that we'll go into in a little bit more detail, but there are plenty of water activities you can do on the lake as well, whether you're interested in sailing or uh, want to do a paddle boat or just a kayak or something a little bit more low key. So we'll have Paul share a little bit more about that as we move forward, but just to give you guys an idea of some of the other things in, in that area in upstate New York. So with that, Adele, why don't you give us an overview of the AVAs in New York, and then we'll get into our wines for today. So like the, uh, the AVAs are basically like regions that have some sort of like stipulation or rules when it comes to quality winemaking that someone has isolated this part of New York and said that, you know, this can be called you know, the Finger Lakes, this can be called Long Islands because they, they are doing something that makes them a, a better quality um, than just calling it New York in general. Um, so we have the Finger Lakes almost like right there in the middle, um, the Niagara Escarpments, Lake Erie, and then uh, Hudson Valley. And what I think is really interesting, they grow wine uh, on Long Island, in the north part of Long Island. And there used to be this producer uh, called Southhold Farm and Cellar that was making natural biodynamic wines from this part of New York. They recently have changed operations and moved here to Texas. So you can find the same winemakers, the same style, but now they're using Texas grapes and wines. So it's kind of a New York meets Texas thing. Uh, they also have wine in uh, like the Northamptons. Uh, just last night, uh, Dan and I were watching Grey Gardens. Have you seen this documentary from the 70s? It features this like dilapidated 28 room mansion in the Hamptons and these like mother daughter who kind of live there and they're hoarders and they're like the aunt and cousin of, of Jackie Onassis like Jackie O who was married to, to JFK and basically I guess through whatever inheritance has kind of run dry and they just sort of like live amongst like raccoons and it's interesting because there's this kind of like takes place in the 70s of of um, the Hamptons. It's kind of a, a fun thing if you guys are looking for something cool to watch on Netflix while you're drinking the rest of your, your New York wines later today, I highly recommend it. So are we ready to start drinking some wine? You wanna, yeah. So uh, the first wine that we put together in our flight uh, for today is the Herman J. Weimer. 
uh, which is what I am drinking right now. Um, and Vimer. Vimer. Ah, Vimer. Donk, donk, donk <laughs> so the Hermitage Vimer, I think, is something that if we're going to talk about New York wines, let's get something iconic and classic. Um, and so this was a, a winery that was founded in 1979. So if we're remembering back to our theory, which I mentioned earlier, how Constantine Frank sort of made Riesling popular in the 50s, uh, well, in 1979, just a you know, a couple decades later, uh, this vineyard has sort of been one of the pioneers of viniculture and winemaking in the Finger Lakes, and is arguably what a lot of people, including Robert Parker and other wine, very important people say um, consistently that they are the top Riesling producer in all of the United States here in the Finger Lakes. Um, the winemaker, Herman, well, owner, who is now passed everything on to the younger generation. Actually, this was apprentice who's now taking things over. Uh, but he originally was a native of Germany and he immigrated to the Finger Lakes in the 60s and wanted to kind of take what he learned in Germany and, and transplant it here, um, making wines that sort of emulate the style of the Mosul, um, a very famous region in Germany for making great quality Riesling. Um, their estate spans about 80 acres. They have quite a bit of land. And they're on the western slopes of Seneca Lake, uh, which is a cool place to visit. Actually, all three of these wineries are very close together if one was to want to knock all of them out in one day. I think you easily could. Um, but this Riesling is dry in style. Uh, it has typical characteristics. You get that sort of like white peach, that nectarine, and, and it has a little bit of the petrol. And although this is a dry Riesling, it sees about 0.5, maybe 0.7 percent of residual sugar, uh, and that's grams per liter. So it, there is just like a little bit of sweetness to this one, uh, but the wine itself I think is like very expressive. It's very aromatic. It just jumps out of the glass. It's very easy to smell. You can probably, you know, I can smell it from here. So, you know, some other wines you really got to put your mm -hmm. glass, um, but this one I think is very expressive, and um, on that residual sugar note, in comparison to like a Moscato, Moscato has like 90 to 100 grams of residual sugar. So this is 0.7. So it's just very, very negligible, but it does add this really interesting sort of rich mouthfeel to this. I think that this wine, if you were to compare it to like a Sauvignon Blanc, this wine has, it's a little bit thicker weighted in the palate. Um, it's interesting um, that this is from New York because when I think about Riesling, even when I think about Riesling, I think most of us think of sweeter wines. And when I think about the dry Rieslings I like, they, most of them don't come from New York. I don't know if I ever, I, if when I smell this, I can definitely tell it's Riesling, but I don't know if I ever would have guessed that it's from the Finger Lakes just because of some of the preconceived notions I've had about it. So this is really fantastic. And lots of these wines are pretty, these wines and these wineries are pretty new, right? Yes, yeah, I mean, this, this one's from 1979 that they've been working here. And, uh, Which is not old in wine. In maybe. wine terms. <laughs> exactly. Very, very new uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, like when you're saying other dry Riesling styles, I think of Austria, I think mm -hmm. of Western Australia, uh, but I don't think of, of Finger Lakes, New York. Uh, so this is really good. And the acidity on this wine is super high. It makes your mouth just kind of pucker and water, which is great too, because acidity is a natural preservative for wines. So this is something that is age worthy. If you were to look for more wines of this style, you could lay them down. They're not going to go bad. That's These really cool. One of the grapes that can last for sure. So I remember there was this trend for a while in Houston that was, and, and maybe in Texas, maybe it's an international thing, you, you'll know better than I do, but it was the summer of Riesling. And I don't remember if that was in June or July or in August, but regardless, since bars are closed, this is kind of the, the perfect summer of Riesling uh, wine to kind of kick off our mid-July uh, wine tasting with. Yeah, the, at the summer of Riesling, it was like for the whole month of July, and I can't remember what the wine psalm's name was, but he was from Terroir in New York City, like super famous wine bar back in their heyday when they were super, super popular. I want to say his name was like 
Paul or Peter or something. And he had just started this campaign to get all of the other Psalms like around the United States and in other parts of the world after that to feature Riesling to kind of promote this under the radar grape. And it sort of stopped because everyone uh, was enlightened. Like <laughs> you reach a certain point, like, okay, yeah, we get it. Like, and then, and Riesling became more popular and, and thus the summer Riesling ended. No more promotion necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, for those of us who opened up the red wine tonight, let's, let's get into that one, shall we? Paul Greco is the Riesling man. Thank you, Jess White from the thing. I could not remember for the life of me. I met this guy. He was, when they came to Houston, they had like a, like a van that they had like traveled around the country with, or it was like an Airstream or something like that. How and funny. he was like, packing up. yeah. I, uh, I remember reading about him in a book my brother gave me for Christmas one year called Cork Dork uh, about some New York journalist who decided she wanted to become a sommelier one day and didn't realize how hard it was. And she studied with him or trained with him or got her first real som job with him or something along those lines. And uh, so if anybody wants to dive into that, that's, that's a book I would also recommend. So let's, let's drink some red wine. It's Texas, it's summer, we don't care. It's red wine every day of the year. Let's, uh, let's talk about this guy. Well, I'm hoping that everyone may have like pulled this from their personal wine cellar, which was nice and chilled a little bit, because this one I think really benefits from just a very, very slight, you know, 13 Celsius or 55 and a half degrees uh, to really, enjoyed this wine. Um, if not, no worries. Um, I just opened mine up here. Um, so this is from Element Winery. Uh, it's a small production winery. It was founded in 2009, so it's very new. Um, and it has this mission to create high quality weight wines that are very distinctly Finger Lakes, trying to develop a, a sense of terroir for Finger Lakes. Um, and this is from a master psalm, and his name is Christopher Bates. So he makes this wine. He pushes the limits of the expectations of what people might define as Finger Lakes. Uh, and he works with different grapes that he's intentionally planted on different soils and different sites um, to, to see what is possible from the, the Finger Lakes. Um, he is inspired by a lot of old world wines and makes wine in that same style. And when we say old world, we mean wines that are maybe a little bit more lower in alcohol, higher in acid, uh, and very balanced between minerals and fruit. Uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, Chris Bates, I have not personally met this, this guy, but he is a, a world-renowned psalm, I would say, um, who in 2012, he won, it was like world's best psalm, and he also won like top psalm and best psalm in America. But it was interesting because like at the time when he won all these awards, the place that he was working at, he was the executive chef and general manager. So he wasn't even technically like the floor psalm uh, when all these things happened. Um, but he, according to his, his bio, uh, was at the uh, Inn at Dos Brisas and also Hotel Faucher. I might pronounce that wrong, but that's kind of where uh, he's from. Uh, these wines are meant to be drunk young. They're meant to be drunk fresh. So I was hoping that everyone put a little bit of a chill on it. Uh, but this is a blend of three different grapes. Uh, so we've got Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, and just a touch of a grape called Blaufrankisch. Uh, so Blaufrankisch is kind of an interesting grape that we normally see planted in Austria, which then sort of made its way into Germany. And then it looks like they're experimenting now with it uh, in the Finger Lakes. Um, and what they're finding about this grape is that it has the ability to handle extreme winters, which is perfect because it's the Finger Lakes in upstate New York. Um, this grape is also fairly relative to disease, uh, which helps as well, and also means that it doesn't necessarily need a whole lot of like harsh chemicals to help make it grow and grow well. Um, I think that this grape sees a little bit of promise um, in the future. We also have Pinot Noir here, um, which is very, I guess say more like old world style, a little bit lighter style Pinot than you would than compared to like the Oregon ones that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, and lastly, Cabernet Franc, which we associate with France. Um, and if you were to compare Cabernet Franc from New York to that of California, it'll, it'll be lighter in style. How do you guys like this wine? I hope everyone's oh. giving it a thumbs up. 
so I just learned that we had a surprise guest join us tonight. And if he's willing, I'd like to give him an opportunity to jump in. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, if I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I say your, your last name wrong, but Daniel Pendleton is actually the sommelier at FLX Table. And he made a surprise appearance on our call tonight. So Daniel, if you have a minute and want to unmute yourself, I'd love to invite you to tell us a little bit about uh, FLX Table and what you think of this wine and uh, introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, my friend Jess White, I, I'm it's just fun to listen in and like hear y'all are saying because like I've only been here a week, like a week or a week and a half. Uh, so I'm really new to the area, but I've been out. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm obviously so I'm at FLX Table now. Uh, FLX Table is, is one of Christopher Bates' pl places. It's a 14, r r roughly a 14 seat um, tasting menu, if you say, if you will, with a bunch of wine pairings that go along with it. And my job is to do all the wine pairings. Um, I've had this wine, I've had most of Christopher Bates' wines. We're actually pouring their 2015 Merlot, which is one of the first wines that they made. It was their first vintage of the Merlot. They did two years of that, and now he's got his own. His, 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 he's he, he, he's then making that from his own his own his own vineyard. Um, this wine is really light. Like you get the Cabernet Franc character as a green green note, but it also has this like beautiful floral character and just ripe red and black fruit. Um, we're also pouring their 2010 Riesling. And that wine has, to me, it's like, it's kind of like the style of reason you might get from the Rheingau with a little bit of age because you have the, all of the elements of that wine are so much more concentrated and intense. And you get this like, kind of like stone fruitiness with like loads of acid and mineral character coming across on the, on the, on the, on the, on the palate as well. Um, the Pinot Noir he makes is it's like premier cru burgundy with with very little oak notes to it um wow. it's floral it's way more savory and kind of earthy than stuff that i tend to, that, that i've noticed from from even cool sites in oregon like ch ch like ch ch like shahila mountains um he also makes Syrah, and he's Christopher Bates is pretty convinced that Syrah actually has a, has a really good future in the Finger Lakes. It makes stuff that isn't quite as ripe as what you get in the Northern Rhone. Um, it tends to be lighter in color and it tends to be much more... It kind of looks like... It kind of looks like Cabernet Franc and kind of looks like Pinot Noir. It's like that very really light color to it. Um, but there's this cool spiciness that comes across. Um, and it's... It's like Washington, but if you just kind of tone down all of the all of the like the power and the alcohol and, and the kind of root, the, the really ripe fruit. Um, those wines to me have a lot of potential up here. Um, the Mer the Merlot is, as I was mentioning earlier, is something that I would kind of akin is more in common with something you might get from Saint from Saint Emilion. It's it's like you would never pick it for New World wine, right? It's <laughs> you get like just ripe blueberries and then kind of this like ripe raspberry strawberry note as well for, for, the, for, the, for the fruit. But it's, you still get pears and you still get that like green spice that comes across that so you just don't, it often gets lost when Merlot gets really ripe. So um, there's some fun wines up here. There's Super cool. the restaurant culture is growing rapidly. There's a strong wine community in the region and you see <laughs> it's just things like, like there's a much stronger wine community for, for what I would expect for such a rural region, than than I was kind of and kind of, and and anticipating. So that's super exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you for jumping in, Daniel. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but um, it was such a nice surprise to to have you pop in tonight, and I'm so glad that. Jess extended the invitation and that you were able to tell us a little bit about it. And I hope uh, when we all visit the Finger Lakes that we will join you and get to drink all of these wines and try them in person. Yeah, come by. It's super fun. Definitely. Um, would, love to have, would love to have you all in. For sure. Well, Can with you, that, you? go ahead, Adele. Uh, I was gonna ask, just like, is it is it, it the the restaurant easy to get to, or is this the table like is that part of the winery? Are they next to each other, or is it separate? So, 
they don't have a winery tasting room. Um, they, like, they have their vineyards, which are over on the east side of Seneca Lake, primarily in the town, most in the town, in the town of Lodi. Um, I think it's hilarious. It's called Lodi because I think I've, I associate Lodi with California. <laughs> it's not even close. Um, they have, so on, in downtown kind of old town of Geneva, New York, which is at, this, at the northern end, northern end of Seneca Lake, um, Linden Street, they have FLX Provisions which is like their wine shop and also doubles as their tasting room. Um, and then next to that is FLX table. So it used to be one table and this was like, the concept was it was like a dinner party. It was like them doing, it was based on the dinner parties that they used to throw for their for, for their friends and family at home. Um, because of COVID it's always split up now and in, into like four or five, five different tables. But originally it was just like one big table. That's I think Chris Russo has it, it, has it in his basement somewhere. Um, Next to that is like, I feel like it's Freibird and they've got like eight other concepts just kind of spread around the, spread, spread around the area. Most of them on the lowbrow side is a place called the Wienery, which is hot dogs and really baller burgundy and champagne. I'm sorry, what was it called again? That was called the Wienery? I feel like it's Wienery because you're telling wieners. <laughs> and they've got a secret wine fridge where you can just like grab like 600 to $800 bottles of like red burgundy and champagne and I love stuff. it crazy age so you know drink crazy wine eat hot dogs that thank sounds you. fantastic well thank you again daniel it was so great to have you join us and and share a little bit about that um and adele why don't you introduce our next guest so i'm super, I'm super excited so for those of you guys hopefully everyone picked up all three wines uh but if not uh I have a couple more at the bar um, if you didn't get a chance to try it now, but we have Paul from Boundary Breaks, so feel free to pop open your bubbly Riesling, uh, and Paul is going to jump on. I met Paul, I guess, earlier this year or maybe late last year when he was, like, working the market and schlepping wine and stuff like that, and I was interested already in these wines, and he was extremely knowledgeable, and I'm excited that he's here to join us, so take it away, Paul. Paul, we need you to unmute yourself. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Got old soul apparently, and I don't know technology. <laughs> uh, is it working now? It's working. Yeah. We can hear you. Great. Awesome. All right. So, it, you don't know me. Uh, my name is Paul Mosley. I am the head of sales at Boundary Breaks. Uh, if you don't know anything about Boundary Breaks, we're located in Lodi, New York, not Lodi, California. Um, Lodi is a super small town, roughly about five miles long. That's about it. If you sneeze, you'll kind of fly, fly right by it. Um, but it's a super small winery and a tiny little dirt road. We produce really world-class Rieslings. Um, one of the challenges that we do have when it comes to uh, creating our Rieslings uh, is the water retention in our soil. So if you don't know anything about the soil in the Finger Lakes, we have a lot of clay soil. So a lot of like silt loom style of soil holds a ton of water. If you know anything about Riesling, it doesn't like that much water. So we kind of had to figure out what we needed to do before we even planted any vines. Um, so Bruce Murray, the owner of Boundary Breaks, decided to uh, dig down about four feet under all of the vines that he was going to plant um, and install an irrigation system. It was called uh, uh, drainage tiles. So these drainage tiles, it's, uh, it's a passive style of of draining and uh, since our vineyard is at a nice slope, all the water that goes into our soil drops down onto these drainage tiles just passively and drops right back into the gully on each side, which is uh, actually where I get our name from. Um, so there's breaks in each boundary on the northern and southern border of our vineyard. Um, that's kind of where our name comes from is all the glaciers and the, the cracks that they created there too. Um, I myself grew up in the Finger Lakes. I grew up roughly about five miles away from the winery, which is really cool to represent my hometown. Um, I did not know I was going to get into the wine business. I actually went to school for physical education, personal training, all that good stuff. Realized that wasn't gonna make me much money. And I realized I like to drink a lot too. Um, so I decided, well, why not make some money while I drink at the same time, right? Oh, that's how I got into wine too. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Cheers. Um, so, Cheers. Uh, so the bubbly that we have tonight is a beautiful wine. Um, it is a forced carbonated Riesling, so it's not natural champagne method. Um, we do force the CO2 in there kind of like a soda. 
uh, really, really affordable for us, uh, which allowed us to land on Wine Enthusiasts list, which they went around the world and found 1,300 bubblies uh, that were under $25, and ours hit number 12 last year. Um, so really, really awesome with that, but we really wanted to make a bubbly wine that was going to be affordable for everybody. Um, and it's a fantastic wine in the summertime. It's great for mimosas, toss a little pineapple in there too. I take it on my paddleboard whenever I can. It's just, it's, it's a beautiful summer wine. Perfect patio pounder. Perfect patio pounder. You know, down in Texas was the first time I ever heard that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, it's like a summer rite of passage. You have to get your pa your patio pounders to, to kick it off um, when summer starts in February, at the end of February. So, <laughs> um, so the winery looks beautiful and you guys are doing a bunch of really cool things in addition to this bubbly wine. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about just what life is like on the vineyard and then I wasn't able to add your ice wine photos to, um, to my presentation tonight, but I do have them and I will try to share them once we get into that so everybody can just kind of see because I think that's kind of a, a dying art worldwide as um, the planet gets a little bit warmer and so it's really fascinating that you can still find that, that we have those wines um, here in the United States and that you guys are making them in the Finger Lakes. Absolutely. And, there, and there's a ton of a ton of cheaters out there too that love to make those $25 ice wines. Um, so ours <laughs> is definitely a traditional style ice wine. Um, I'm out there trying to do two feet of snow and some of my frozen tears are probably in the bottle that you taste next to. Um, so it, it's a lot of work to make an actual ice wine. Um, but yeah, the Finger Lakes, it's, it's, a, it's a very short um, season. So we, we have to pay attention to every single minute um, when it comes to producing a really ripe Cabernet Franc. We have to make sure that we are removing leaves as much as possible, that we're bringing our vines straight up in the air so that way east and west is getting the same amount of sunlight. Um, when it comes to, um, like once again, the, 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 the water retention is a huge thing. So if you didn't have any type of irrigation system and your, your, your grapes started swelling started diluting you start getting a lower quality style of wine um so that is definitely a big thing for us um another thing that they're like is pests um that is definitely a hard thing to deal with especially ice wine because ice wine you know these grapes are on the vines for almost 10 months we have to deal with deer birds raccoons um, we have this thing called a deer shield which is really interesting it creates these really horrific deer sounds um, that almost sound like deers in distress and deer know that if there are deer in distress, they stay away. So what does, a deer, what does a deer in distress sound like? I know. Say it. Like, do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Um, actually, you know, I might be able to have a video up here for you in a second. Um, but yeah, so it is, it, is, it is a very horrific sound. I actually was making a video for Boundary Breaks, which hopefully you guys will see shortly. We're going to be sending a couple of videos out to all of our distributors. We'll be sending to all the buyers, um, which will have all the deer sounds in there. Um, I actually might be Can't, can't wait one. for this. Can't wait for this. Well, yeah. while you're looking for that, um, oh, I yeah, tried to share the photo of um, the, I guess, picking the grapes for the ice wine. Can everybody see that? Is that on your screens? I can yes. see it. Okay, fantastic. So, and actually, I have a question for yes. uh, either Daniel or Paul. Um, so traditionally, uh, wine in the Finger Lakes, in Seneca in particular, has been on the preferred to be on the west side because then you get more afternoon sun. Why did you pick to do on the east side of the lake, uh, knowing it's going to be colder and a little bit less shielded? Um, we, so the east side, there's actually about a 12 mile strip called the banana belt on the east side, which has a little bit of richer soil. We have warmer, uh, wind coming from the west side to the east side as well. And we actually get a little more sun on the east side. Um, the west, the, 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 the second half of the day, the sun is also hotter, um, which can burn out a lot of your grapes. So we have to make sure that we keep a lot of leaves on the west side of our vines as well. So that way our grapes don't get burned out because of it. Um, but we, over at Boundary Breaks, uh, we, we really believe um, that the east side, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's super hard. It is so hard because it, it, the terroir is so scattered in the Finger Lakes. And I, it, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm never going to say that Riesling's produced on the east side is always going to be better than Riesling's produced on the west side because that's not true. Um, 
but I do. But I it do. sounds like there's like some interesting thoughts uh, have changed uh, apart from the like 80s, I guess, guess or thought that the West Side was categorically better. That was like the historic thought. It's interesting to hear how that shifted a bit. Thank yes. You. Thank you. I, I, I think I think it's the um, the AVAs that are being created in the Finger Lakes, to be honest with you. And then the smaller microclimates within the smaller microclimates that we're starting to discover. Um, so I think it's still, I think the answers are slowly changing throughout the years. I really do. That's a good question. Good question. Great question. Thank you. Um, so Paul, why don't you tell us what exactly it is we're looking at in these photos? Uh, the ice wine? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So what, like, when you guys are picking them, is there anything? Yes. Um, so it's, a. Uh, it's a huge pain in the ass to start off with. <laughs> um, so, Bru oops, uh, there we go. So Bruce will call us roughly around 4.30 in the morning um, because there is a very small window to pick ice wine. It's usually between 15 degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's the little Goldilocks paradox right there because the juice isn't frozen yet, but the water is, which means that when we pick the grapes and we press them right off of the vine, the only thing that is coming out of those grapes is the grape juice, the concentrated grape juice. Okay. So if we wait till it gets under zero degrees, the water or the grape, the juice will also be frozen. So that way we're not going to be in anything. It's basically like, like pressing, um, you know, marbles for the most part. If we do it too warm, then there's going to be water melted within the juice and it's not going to be nearly as concentrated. You're going to get a thinner ice wine and the quality won't be as great. Um, there is also uh, a little bit of noble rot, a little botrytis that goes through um, on our grapes as well. It adds a little honey, honeydew style of flavor to the finish. For our guests who don't know what that is, will you give them the, the five second like version yeah, or <laughs> explanation yeah, of what it is? Absolutely. Uh, it's basically a mold that grows on top of the grapes that changes the chemical compound inside the grape changing the flavors from more fruit to more of like a honey, more sugary flavor. Um, really, really cool. And then also our grapes, <laughs> our grapes go, go through uh, the Maillard effect, which if you don't know what that is, that's actually when you caramelize onions. So when you're changing the flavor of onions, the grapes are on the vines for so long, the sun actually caramelizes our grapes, which in turn changes the flavors as well, adds a little bit more of a syrupy texture to it. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, there's a lot of lot of cool things that go on with the with the ice wine. So after so we Paul, it, like yes. Paul, how would you describe that or compare it to something like a Tokai, which has the botrytis, but not necessarily the ice. Clearly not the ice, but sort of from a sweetness standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's a it's a. I, hmm. It's a good good question. I, um, I might jump in on that one and say that usually the Tokais have like the different levels of sugar um, left over that the Tokais, I think, tend to be sweeter depending on the different levels or, or numbers of putonios. The darker sugars too, isn't it yeah. usually? That's a good question. I would I honestly, I do not have an answer for you on that one. Um, I myself am not a Somalia. <laughs> <laughs> Could one come and volunteer their time if they just happen to be, be in the area to help pick ice wine? Is that something that people do? Oh, absolutely. You know, we ask for volunteers every single year, um, and we also have to ask for new ones the next year because uh, they don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think many, um, at least as a Houstonian myself, um, I've never experienced a sub-15 degree day here. Sure. So, um, yeah, not in Houston, at least. Not so um, anytime it drops below like 65 degrees, I like need my sweatshirt, my jacket, and snow looks really, really cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for sharing um, with us a little bit about the wine. And I'm going to kind of circle back to um, the presentation that we have right now. And... I, uh, you mentioned that you grew up in the Finger Lakes, and I know that Boundary Breaks is actually on the Seneca Lake Wine Trail. And I touched a little bit on this earlier. And what, so, so tell us about the area. Tell us about your favorite things to do, your favorite places to eat. And for those of you who have questions for Paul, type them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring them and asking as we go. But tell us a little bit about this wine trail, what there is to do besides that, where you like to stay, and how many days you can spend here and really make good use of your time. 
Well, uh, once you come, I don't think you'll ever want to leave, I guess, until snow falls. Um, but I mean, I, I'm a huge trail runner myself. Uh, I'm a huge skateboarder. I love to paddle boards. I'm always on the lake. My girlfriend and I, we, we get up five o'clock in the morning, half the time and spend a couple hours on the lake before we ever go to work. Um, the, the gorges are absolutely beautiful. If obviously it is gorgeous, the big pond that's going on. Um, it is, it's the perfect combination of city and nature. It really is. If you've never been to Ithaca, it is absolutely beautiful. Geneva is up and coming, which is where Finger Lakes Table is. That, that was actually one of the restaurants I was going to mention tonight. Um, so it's really cool to see Daniel on today. Um, but Finger Lakes Table is absolutely fantastic. Farm to table. You can't beat their food. Kindred Fair is also a really cool place to check out in Geneva. Um, Halsey's is a little bit, a little more upscale, more of a, um, Italian style of restaurant, but they have a lot of local wines. And then Red Dove is definitely a really cool spot to check out if you want to come hit up locals. If you're going to start heading down on the east side, on the start heading south towards Watkins Glen, down towards Boundary Breaks, Lodi, Burdette, Hector area, um, you have Two Goats, which is a huge hang for locals. A lot, anybody who's in the industry goes there usually at 5 30, 6 o'clock at night, pounds a couple beers. Um, Lucky Hair is another brewery that's right up the road as well. It's a really, really cool place. Um, if you're going out to Ithaca, Agava is probably one of the best Southwest restaurants out there. It's really, really amazing. Once again, they have a lot of local wineries. Cultivare is Cornell Farm to Table. So all of the Cornell farms, all their food goes right through Cultivare. And once again, they really focus on local wines. Um, and then if you haven't heard about Ithaca Beer Company yet, um, that's a really cool one, too, because they have a ton of wines from the Finger Lakes. They always focus on local. They're actually starting to create their own homestead. So all of the food they're going to start uh, selling, they're going to start going right out back and picking themselves, which is really, really awesome. Um, so, yeah, per, I, I, I love to run. I love to skate. And I love to drink, basically. There's a, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> to do. I like to, I like to be outside. I think... Um you have a lot of people on this call who like similar things. We've got lots of people who like to drink, they like to be on the water, they like hiking, they like running, they like biking, they like being outdoors. And in kind of the unique space that we are as a planet right now, I think people are really gravitating towards these uh, these short drives away from major cities where they can immerse themselves entirely in nature. And while you are talking to a predominantly Texas audience today, we do have a few Vermonters on the call. So uh, I know this is really landing with a couple of them as far as uh, road trips that they could actually take this summer or this fall and come and see you guys and do wine country without having to get on an airplane and fly over to the, uh, to the West Coast. So that is super exciting. And, and thank you for sharing your, um, your recommendations with us. And when it comes to one yeah. last question, when it comes to the Seneca, Li the Seneca Lake Wine Trail, um, tell us exactly what that is and what kind of the, and, and how many days you would recommend to actually do it. Yeah, um, I mean, I would recommend, uh, if, you, if you really want a good experience, if you're looking for a tourist experience, I do the Seneca, Seneca Lake Wine Trail. I mean, there's 50, 60 wineries on the Seneca Lake Wine Trail now. Um, you're going to be spend, spending four or five days doing it. Um, they're all over the place. If, if you want to look at something more specific, there is something called a Finger Lakes Wine Alliance. Now, this mm -hmm. is 13 wineries that are really taking wine seriously. Um, so if you're looking for good dry Rieslings from the Finger Lakes, if you're looking for good dry Reds from the Finger Lakes, the, those 13 wineries are a really good place to check out. Um, it, it, it all depends on really what you want to do, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. The Finger Lakes Wine Trail definitely has a ton of stuff for you to do. There's restaurants all, of, all along it. Um, it's, it, it. They're split up in between the lakes as well. So there's Seneca Lake Wine Trail, there's Cayuga Lake Wine Trail, Cayuga Lake Wine Trail. Um, so it all depends on what you want to do. Seneca Lake Wine Trail and I believe Yucca Lake Wine Trail are probably the best ones you could do, in my opinion. Um, if you're staying out in Ithaca, Yucca is definitely the one you'd be doing. Um, I, would, I would suggest to stay on either the west or the east side of Seneca Lake. Um, on the east side, there's a new brewery called Grisarn Brewing Company that they have a, a hotel right there, roughly about 60 rooms. Um, so you could get up, take a shower, walk right down and have some food and a drink as well. And they serve wine. They, I, they might serve spirits. I'm not sure right now. 
Um, but they're, 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 I would say if you're going to do the Sonoma Wine Show, give yourself at least four or five days. Perfect. That's fantastic. And I hope some of you guys who are joining us from New England uh, can make this happen this year. And uh, I think it would be a fantastic way to just get out of town and to do something a little different. Uh, for those of you who have high school kids, college kids, uh, there are tons of colleges in this area. Cornell among others. And this is a perfect way to kind of treat yourself after you uh, take the kids to, to view the different schools up there. And, um, and the universities have lots of additional things to, to offer as well in terms of museums and history. So that's something really I'll fun to keep in mind. Um, Chris, I find that, that, that deer noise. So if anyone did want to hear this, we'll, <laughs> we'll them all, come. all right, let's see. Let's see if we can okay. hear it. Oh my so god. Adele, think, Adele I had it. I that noise before, but I think that I think I made that noise after drinking uh like 12 bloody berries oh, yeah. in New Orleans uh, one night. Oh dears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <actually. laughs> well, thank you so much, Paul. It was a pleasure to have you and thank you for for sharing your knowledge and telling us about your wines and uh and your home state and hometown. It was uh it was really an honor to, to host you tonight. And we're really grateful that you took the time to join us. Well, um, thanks for having me guys. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. And I hope to do, I hope to come down to Texas at some point. So we'll see. Any, when, when you make it down here, please get in touch. I know lots of these native Texans here would love to come and meet you in person and drink your wines and uh, talk to you. So we would love to orchestrate an event with 13 Celsius when, when you're around so that we can uh, continue to go deeper into everything you have going on. Absolutely. And maybe Sounds try some of those ice wines. <laughs> <Sounds good. laughs> All right, guys. Well, I always like to feature a major city, uh, the nearest major city when we have these talk, taste, and travel events. And the city that we're visiting today is Toronto. So Toronto is typically the, the city where we have the most daily direct flights. It's the easiest to get there from Houston if you are based in Houston. Obviously, the border is closed right now, so that's not something that's going to happen. But this is kind of an easy round trip destination or an entry or exit point. And there's so much to do in Toronto. It's Canada's largest city, I believe, and it has beautiful natural uh, elements to the city. And then it's also a museum, or it's also a Mecca for art and for museums. The Aga Khan is a, a museum that features Islam art and history. And I'm sure many of you guys have heard of the Toronto Film Festival. That's something that happens here every year. And Toronto is really a, a cosmopolitan city with a lot going on and a lot to do. And then Niagara Falls, whether you are visiting from Buffalo or whether you're visiting from Toronto, uh, my partners at one of the companies I work with called American Excursionist put together this list of some really fantastic activities you can do in Niagara Falls and in Toronto. You can see the falls from above with a helicopter flyover, or if helicopters aren't your cup of tea, you can go to a nighttime light show and fireworks display over the falls and then have a three course dinner with beautiful views. One thing that I think is really fascinating about Niagara Falls is how accessible it is from the, the major cities. If you've been to any of the other big like massive waterfalls around the world, whether it's uh, Iguazu Falls or Victoria Falls, they, they, they don't have a city like Toronto with such quick and easy access. Uh, Niagara Falls also has its own little wine area and you can bike through that and see the different uh, wineries and taste different ones. You can do white water rafting on the Ottawa River, board a private boat and actually tour the capital from the boat and uh, go through the Ottawa locks. Uh, one thing that is starting to trend in the travel tourism industry is um, Great Lakes cruises. And so they're starting to make ships that can actually go through the locks and you can explore these uh, rivers and travel pretty far inland from the Atlantic. Um, 
you can do a, you can sail on Lake Ontario, or you can just take a relaxing canoe ride in one of the green spaces, and you can bring your wines from, that you picked up in the Finger Lakes to kind of end your trip on that note, and uh, before you, before you fly home. So with that, that wraps up our New York Finger Lakes wine region, uh, presentation, happy hour webinar, whatever you want to call it today. It was a pleasure to have you guys and to have so many new people joining us. And next week we are heading south and we will travel from New York or from Texas, take your pick, down to Australia. So we, Adele and I talked a little bit about what the, the next wineries were that we wanted to visit and what the next regions uh, were and we did decide that we wanted to visit some of well my favorite places <laughs> in the entire world so I'm super excited I visited all of these upcoming regions within the past five years and we are really really looking forward to it so before we wrap are up we, are we going to Adelaide to the to the area McLaren Vale and uh, well We'll let you know. Adele is uh, checking on the wines right now. And so we should be releasing that list uh, tomorrow, Adele, or will it be Friday? Tomorrow, well, yeah, I, I think tomorrow. Okay. For so, sure. and, then, and then the wines will be here by Friday. So hopefully you guys can come and pick them up um, starting this weekend. So we will have those out to you guys very soon. And I'm about to open everything up for uh, a Q&A for those of you guys who uh, have any questions for me or for Adele. And it looks like Paul is still on the call, so you can ask him as well. Daniel's here too. And then our favorite, Jess White, who didn't chat today, but those of you who had a, a chance to meet her over the past couple of weeks, she is with us again. So you can ask any of us questions. But real quick announcement, we are going to be uh, having many more guests coming on as we move forward and we're going to continue sharing content and we want to keep these interesting we want to keep them fun we want to keep them fresh and I think the the guests have really added a lot to the experience and it's been a lot of fun for us um, this is something that Adele and I spend a lot of time working on every single week and we do it for we, we do it for free. And Adele does sell the wines at 13 Celsius, but she and I were discussing ways we can kind of continue to add value moving forward. And so 13 Celsius and Lion Hound are both donating a few things and we'll be sending stuff out. But if you guys want to keep these free and want to keep joining us for them on a weekly basis, uh, we are opening up a donation um, program if you're interested in that and we will send out more information on that in the next couple of days when we share the wines with all of y'all it is not required it is entirely up to you but we do want to give you guys different gifts for the different levels that you can donate for that are related to food wine and travel so we'll be announcing that within the next couple of days as well. And with that, I want to open up the floor for any questions that you guys might still have. We have, it, it is 6.30 right now, so if you guys do have to run, um, we totally understand. Uh, we tried to answer as many questions as we could along the way, and it was delightful to see so many of you guys participating in the chat. But uh, if you do have questions, we'll keep things open for another 10 minutes. And we encourage you guys to set up your own happy hours afterwards to get together and to, to continue this on. Uh, I have a quick question for Paul. Um, and this is a pure curiosity and maybe something harder to figure out through uh, just web searches or Google searches. Have the Finger Lake Wine Trails wineries, a lot of them I know are off the lake and, um, or maybe there's a road along the lake and then are up the banks, uh, up the hill. Are, is, have wine, ex sorry, boat accessible wineries become a thing? Because in Texas as a, or in Houston as a port town, or if you go to some of the cute port towns close by, you can kind of like do bar hopping. And I went mm -hmm. to school up in the Finger Lakes. I always thought it would be great if you could do like kayak hopping. Yeah. Um, 
Un unfortunately, no, not yet. Um, I know Miles Winery, which is on the west side of Seneca Lake, they're the only one that has boat access and they have a wine a tasting bar right there on their dock. Um, there's a couple bars around Seneca Lake. Um, and restaurants, yeah. And restaurants. Uh, we, Boundary Breaks, are only about half a mile up from the lake, but you're right. On the east side of Seneca Lake specifically, um, if, you're, if you're following 414, which is the main road that goes north and south on the east side of Seneca Lake, mm -hmm. most wineries are roughly about two miles away yeah. from the lake shore. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are, you're right. It, there, there aren't too many wineries, and unfortunately, I don't think I see it happening anytime soon. Um, because then at that point, you're going to have to be worrying about not just drunk drivers, but then you have to be promoters and all this stuff too. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why it hasn't happened yet. Um, I would personally love to see it because once again, I'm on the lakes every single day. Um, so it's hard. It's, it really, it really sucks when there's only three, three bars within a 44 mile radius, you know? Um, so, so to answer your question, no, not yet. Um, that would be wonderful. Mary, that's a great uh, question. And um, many of my travel partners are always uh, in, in North America, especially right now, are looking for more creative ways to um, curate experiences that are, are different um, from kind of what exists right now. So that's some feedback I'll share with them and they might be able to make that happen. Especially for the Finger Lakes, they're all so long and so skinny. So if you want to do a wine trail, it can be really hard to drive from the east side of a wine, a winery on the east side to the west side, and you literally have to drive an hour around. Hey, try try t talk to someone who lives in Lodi in the Lodi, <laughs> no, forty-five that's, miles. Uh, um, but you're absolutely, but you're absolutely right. It, it's 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 impeccable to to have something like that because you know wineries that are two miles away from each other just because they're on the east and west. They're an hour and a half away, or an hour away. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's definitely a tough thing that every single lake is north and south and about thirty plus miles long. <laughs> and so similarly, like across the entire region, there's no such thing as driving east to west straight. You have to go around the wineries constantly. Um, yeah, unless you but go all beautiful. the way down to the southern tips. Yeah. Yep. Um, I yeah, I've personally talked about you know trolley systems and everything too, and having you know, <laughs> be able to bring a car from point A to point B, but. Uh, that, that adds a ton of other stuff to it. You know, it's got to worry about the pollution on the lakes too, because that is our terroir. That is, that, that is what makes the Finger Lakes the Finger Lakes. Um, if we lose the Finger, if we lose those lakes, we, uh, we lose everything. Um, so I guess not having that much traffic on the lakes isn't a thing right now, um, which is, it's really interesting because if you're on Seneca Lake, there's barely everybody, anybody on Seneca Lake. If you go over to like Canandaigua Lake, it's, it's, it's totally packed. Um, but we personally, the ones who live on Seneca Lake, uh, we do, we do like the fact that it is mostly empty. <laughs> <laughs> Any but other on questions? that note, there, there are a lot of, um, like biking wine tours. A lot of those, you know, if you pick the East or the West, it's really pretty easy on a cruiser even to get dropped off and cruise between a few wineries, not, not advocating drunk biking, but, mm -hmm. um, are you talking about motorcycles? Either on the west side. Or, yeah, yeah. even better. And there's, a, there's a bicycle race, too, that goes all the way around Seneca Lake, about 77 miles is what the race is. And uh, a lot of these guys stop at wineries and breweries on the way and make sure they get their carbs. <laughs> it's really funny. Awesome. Any other questions? Kristen, I don't have a question, but we didn't um, have access to Celsius, so we tried the Boundary breaks dry Riesling. Oh, I don't know if you can that? see it. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a sparkling wine fan, but this is really a nice Riesling, kind of not sweet, and um, kind of grows on you as you drink it. Good. Yeah. Know. I just recommend it. Where did you get that from? Did you get that from Cork? We. Oh. Did, you know what? I ordered it through Wine.com, um, and it actually came out of Bethpage, New York. So it was here like in 48 hours. Wow. Could, could the Very two cool. winemakers here uh, dump their sales portals in the chat just to make it easy in case anyone really enjoyed their wines and wanted to buy a quarter case or a half case? Definitely. Please. We can, guys, can y'all make that happen? Yes, yeah, so. and isn't just, um, I'm confused. I'm confused with the question. Yeah. 
Just whatever your website is for sale. I'm sure you oh, do absolutely. online sales. If you could just dump that into the chat, that would be really appreciated. I really enjoyed both of your wines. So I'm sure there's stuff we can order to Texas ships that we can't buy local. No, no offense yes. to 13 Celsius. You have some great stuff, but. And I, and I will say on that note, just really fast, I had a hard time finding Finger Lakes wines that were available right now that had quantity more than 12 bottles. Um, there's several things that I've tasted before from the Finger Lakes that they just, they're already sold out. They're not here. Um, like I bought, you know, there was 11 bottles left of this. There was a case left of, of the, the sparkling and everything else was gone. So yeah, I mean, become a wine club member if you love all these wines and see if they can get them. Cause we basically bought all that was left of Finger Lakes wine in Texas is here now in the bar for this class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, and and uh, the, I mean there is there there is new law. Um, so if you, if you uh, look up liquor stores in New York, um, you can actually find um, certain styles that aren't available outside of New York, and you can order directly through the liquor store or the wine shop that is in New York and have it delivered to you from them. Um, so appa apparently it's 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 uh, it's it's kosher now with the federal federal laws. <laughs> Finally. Anna, Adele and I will um, look at the other wines as well and we'll send all of you guys a follow-up email with how to kind of access everything so that if that is something you're interested in doing, whether it's Boundary Breaks or any of the other wines, uh, you guys will have easier access to all of it and don't have to, don't have to search for it. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, guys, before we wrap up this evening? You haven't heard us wrong yet. They're all delicious. Thank you, Peggy. So I just opened the element. Um, the it's fan absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely it, fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Daniel's uh, cheering. <laughs> uh, yeah, like there's a braised short rib. I, mean, I was about to ask, uh, what's the this. what's the food pairing with the element? I think by itself, I I found it not. I wouldn't want to drink it by itself really to my taste, but I think with food, it's grown on me. What food would you recommend pairing with this, the red? I would do lamb and a little bit of goat cheese. Oh. Uh, that I did lamb with it. We did a lamb terrine with it last night for the pairing. <laughs> yes. It was killer. Right on, I, right. I feel like something meaty and fatty sounds wonderful. It's very good. How chill did you have it, Eric? Oh, uh, right about 13. Yeah. Oh. Maybe 13 degrees Celsius? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm, so, uh, like, I'm I'm slowly moving into like metrics and you know everything else for like a move to Europe in a couple of years. I, I actually thought it got programs. a little better after it warmed yeah. up. Not warmed up. That's too strong of a word. But right out of the. Line. I have to agree. I think it gave it 15 minutes. It was better a mm -hmm. tiny bit above that cellar temperature. It That's gave better. more balance. And I like that a lot because oftentimes it's just allowing the wine to breathe for a second and it's able to express itself as it does warm. Uh, it gives you kind of this opportunity to see it within a transition because I love drinking chilled red wines. Like, I love it. But I also understand that as it evolves on the, uh, in the glass, it's like super, super fun. But I do have it in one of these, so I'm keeping it a little chilled. But... <laughs> I like I'm it. using one of those too. Yeah, it is Houston. <laughs> That's very true. I'm in Oregon and it's really nice today. So, uh, I actually have a question for Paul or whoever is currently upstate. Um, I, I, so much of visiting up to upstate New York is driven by seasons because people go up for peepers or people go up for college visits in the spring and then do wine tours or something like that. Um, and my knowledge is, I, I went to school upstate, I, my knowledge is a little bit old. Is that less of a thing now and you can really go up all year round and everything's plenty open out, except for the little corner side ice cream shops? Is there a time that you personally would recommend for visiting wineries right uh -huh. now? Well, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, all the wineries are, you know, 40 miles long. Um, so when, when the snow starts dropping, um, you, you Texans might start freaking out um, just because there is, you know, two, three, two, three feet of snow sometimes. Um, we are open still 11 to 5 every single day all year round. So if you do want to trudge, yeah. you know, the tundra, you're more than welcome to and we will always accept you. Um, we will have a fire waiting for you as well. <laughs> 
So the tasting um, rooms I, don't close in the winter anymore. They used to close no, for- No, and we, okay. so, I mean, most of our production sites are right there on site. So our lights are already on anyways. It would be idiotic of us to close our doors to our customers if we're already there anyway, you know? Um, as for as for a good time to come, I personally believe end of August is a really great time. Uh, one, it's not quite to the point of full harvest. A lot of people wait to the you know, first, second week of September. Um, a lot of uh, students are going back to school. A lot of teachers are going back to school. A lot of parents are getting ready for that as well, uh, which means that there's a lot less people in the wineries. Um, so uh, June, July, it's, it can be pretty hectic. Uh, there's a lot of crowds. Um, I would say, you know, second half of August is probably the best time. And it's when you just start hot harvest. You can see a lot of stuff happening. Um, October is also a really good time, too, because you start seeing all of the leaves change as well. Um, the fallout here yeah. is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you avoid the fruit flies at that point, too. Um, so, you know, right. fruit flies love grapes. And when the grapes start coming into the winery uh, for progressing, the fruit flies like to follow as well. So that's another thing you have to remember. That's good feedback. Or, <laughs> and if you go in the winter, you can assist with some uh, ice wine help, uh, picking before, before yep. uh, warming we'll up with a, a glass of something else. <laughs> well, guys, frozen tears. Frozen tears. <laughs> well, guys, I want to thank you again for, for joining us this evening. It is 6.45, so we are going to wrap up. Um, if anybody does want to uh, set up a Zoom happy hour after this, uh, I can send out an invite if people, or I encourage you guys to send out invites. I'm going to actually have dinner. Um, but it was wonderful to have all of you guys. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. Uh, we'll be sending out an email with the upcoming wine list and the information on the, the upcoming regions. And we'll have more guests coming to join us. And we hope that you guys can, can continue uh, showing up and uh, talking, tasting, and traveling with us while we're uh, stuck at home. Thank you Bye, so much. Everyone. This is always so wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thanks, everyone.